I have something for everyone. You know what these are? Pinwheels. And you know why I chose red pinwheels for today? Because it's Pentecost. Good job. All right. So, here, Kerrigan. So this is sort of like us, and that is sort of like the Holy Spirit. Do it again. Look at that. Can you make it go? If you blow on the side of it, kind of, it seems to go a whole lot better. And maybe down a little bit. I had to practice a long time in my office. This is what I get paid to do. So here's the thing I learned this week, though. Sometimes, no matter how much the, I'm blowing on it, it's like that. It just doesn't. Is yours turning at all? Okay, it was. Okay, but sometimes, like, you blow and blow and blow, and it doesn't really go anywhere, or it gets stuck. And, like, sometimes it just hardly goes at all. So sometimes we're like the pinwheel. And, and the Holy Spirit is like the wind. In fact, in just a little while, you're hear, you'll hear the scripture where it talks about when the Holy Spirit came, it was like, a, well, we said it just a minute ago. It was like a gale force wind, like whoo, the wind just comes rushing through. It was so loud they could hardly hear anything else. And that's what this does, right? It makes the wind. Some, and so the Holy Spirit is always moving like that. But sometimes we're like these pinwheels. And even though the wind is blowing, it just doesn't go anywhere. Like that right now. And sometimes the Holy Spirit says, I want to do really great things in you. And we say, mm, I just want to sit here. Sometimes we're just not in the right position. What if I blew back here? Sometimes we're just not in the right place for, to, to hear God or be used by God. But God always, the Holy Spirit's always doing this. Trying to make us move. So I want you guys to take these pinwheels home. And I want, every time you see it, I want you to remember that we're like the pinwheel. That God is always trying to work in us, to empower us, to be who God wants us to be. To love others and be kind and love Jesus. And so we have to get ourselves to where we're ready to receive that and open ourselves up to that. All right? All right, so what are you going to think of when you see the pinwheel? So just say Pentecost first. Yes. And then what made Pentecost happen? The Holy Spirit. So we're going to, when we look at this, we're going to think Pentecost, Holy Spirit, God can use me. Is that a deal? All right, I'm going to say three, one, two, three, and y'all are going to say God can use me. Are you ready? Are you ready? One, two, two and a half. Oh, three. God can use me. Pretty good. Do you really believe it? I'm going to say it one more time then. One, two, three. God can use me. Even you, right? Yeah. All right, let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for your son Jesus and for the Holy Spirit who helps us to do your work. Help us to receive the Holy Spirit and be filled with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Miss Carolyn has something else for you. Good morning. Today is the day of Pentecost, the birthday of the church. The lesson for today is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21, and I'll be reading from the message version. Listen to this amazing account of the coming of the Holy Spirit on the followers of Jesus, birthing the church. When the feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. Then, like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks. 
and they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. There were many Jews staying in Jerusalem just then, devout pilgrims from all over the world. When they heard the sound, they came on the run. Then when they heard one after another, their own mother tongues being spoken, they were thunderstruck. They couldn't for the life of them figure out what was going on and kept saying, aren't these all Galileans? How come we're hearing them talk in our various mother tongues? Parthians, Medes, and Eliamites, visitors from Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, immigrants from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, even Cretans and Arabs. They're speaking our languages, describing God's mighty works. Their heads were spinning. They couldn't make head or tail of any of it. They talked back and forth confused. What's going on here? Others joked. They're drunk on cheap wine. That's when Peter stood up and backed up by the other 11, spoke out with bold urgency. Fellow Jews, all of you who are visiting Jerusalem, listen carefully and get the story straight. These people aren't drunk as some of you suspect. They haven't had time to get drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. This is what the prophet Joel announced would happen. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Your sons will prophesy, also your daughters. Your young men will see visions. Your old men dream dreams. When the time comes, I'll pour out my spirit on those who serve me, men and women both, and they'll prophesy. I'll set wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billowing smoke, the sun turning black and the moon blood red. Before the day of the Lord arrives, the day tremendous and marvelous, and whoever calls out for help to me, God, will be saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What is Pentecost about? What happened that day drew a lot of attention. It made a big splash. The day started out with the followers of Jesus being holed up in an upper room. And while they were praying, something very unusual happened. The Holy Spirit, God's very presence, came upon all of them. And it was so powerful that it was palpable. It was audible and visible. This, this spiritual event was so unusual that even those who witnessed it talked about hearing a sound like a violent wind and seeing what looked like tongues of fire on each person's head of the followers of Jesus. But that wasn't the only way that it was noticeable. What started out in a closed room, once the Holy Spirit had invaded them, somehow or another got outside where a bunch of other people were, and everybody heard them. They were so filled with joy and ecstasy that people didn't know what to think about it, so they thought they were drunk. The only, pe only way people could be that happy is if they've had something to drink, is what they thought. But then that's not even all what happened. Peter then stood up, this same guy who had cowered around denying that he even knew Jesus a few weeks before, this same Peter stood up in front of a huge crowd that had gathered, couldn't contain himself, and talked boldly about the good news of Jesus. And it says for in the text that about three thousand people 
became part of the Christian community through faith and baptism on that one day. Now, that's almost 300% more people beginning to follow Jesus in one day than Jesus himself had gathered in three years. That's pretty amazing. What Pentecost is about is power. It's the Holy Spirit who did it, not Peter or the other disciples. It's the, it's the Holy Spirit who called the church into being, not some strategic planning group. My brothers and sisters, this congregation's ministry and life together doesn't depend on the cleverness of its pastors. Praise God for that. It doesn't depend on the gifts and ingenuity or commitment of its lay leaders. It depends on the Holy Spirit. Now, God has called me and Michelle and Pastor Rebecca, who's coming, as pastors to work hard, to cast vision, to inspire others, to plan and to do. And, and God has called all of us to give of ourselves, to use our best resources of talent and time and money and all the rest. But it's the Holy Spirit who brings about renewal in the church. Mike Slaughter, who's a pastor of a vibrant, growing, outwardly focused congregation in the Dayton, Ohio area, whom I've known for quite a number of years, basically 20 years now. And I heard him say one time in speaking, and I've always remembered this, he said, renewal is God-breathed, not program-planned. As we baptize children as infants in the church, we expect them to grow up and to commit themselves to Christ, to live as Christians in the world, to study, to pray, to worship, and to serve. But I want to say to you that they're, they're becoming part of the community of faith as disciples of Jesus doesn't ultimately depend on any of that. It depends on the Holy Spirit. As a parent... I have brought up my children in the church. I have prayed and agonized and tried my best to impart to them my faith, both in what I've taught them and how I've lived my life before them as, as, as imperfectly as I have. But as they have grown up and flown the nest, they're going on to continue to know Jesus Christ and lo as Lord and Savior and to serve God as disciples of Jesus doesn't ultimately depend on anything that I have done. It depends on the Holy Spirit. It wasn't me who called it, called them, even my own children. It was the Holy Spirit. And it's not me who will bring to fruition what God has envisioned for their lives. It will be the Holy Spirit. If as adults, our children are going to be united, ignited with a passion for God and, and, uh, and a passion for the people God loves, it won't be us, it will be the Holy Spirit who will fan that flame. That person that you know, who, uh, that you've prayed for, who, who you've tried to share your faith with, they're coming to know Christ and Christian faith doesn't depend on you. It depends on the Holy Spirit. In your own life, in your living as a disciple of Jesus in your work and in your family and in your relationships, doesn't depend on your effort. It depends on the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that made the difference, you see. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit had come upon these followers of Jesus and empowered them to live the Christian life. The Holy Spirit had come into their lives and made in them a reality of what they'd only heard about and observed in Jesus. They didn't have to drum up that ability to be Christ's representatives in the world. It was imparted to them. Jesus had said before he left them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, meaning 
uh, where you live with those closest to you. In Judea, with those who kind of are, are, are around you. In Samaria, with those who are your more distant neighbors and to the ends of the earth. Not a list of things to do or, or a list of things to avoid doing, none of which we have the power to do on our own anyway. But rather, he's talking about an infu receiving an infusion, inward infusion of life from the Holy Spirit that empowers us and impels us to live out the life and ministry of Jesus. So what happened at Pentecost was that individual believers were filled with the Holy Spirit in such a way that they were able to experience the life of Jesus Christ in their own souls and bodies to live the way He lives and to do the things He did. And this is everyone, not just the leaders, not just the men, not just the older folks, the young, the elderly, the men, the women, everybody. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, the prophet tells us. And each one of us has to experience this fullness of the Holy Spirit for ourselves. You and I have to surrender ourselves by faith to be empowered to do what God has called us to do. And nobody can do that surrender for us. In the same way that we have to confess our own sins <laughs> in order to receive forgiveness. We have to surrender ourselves to the Holy Spirit. You know, we like to confess other people's sins sometimes. But we can't, nobody can vicariously surrender themselves to the Holy Spirit for us. We have to do it ourselves. We're invited to surrender ourselves as individuals to the dwelling fullness of the Holy Spirit. And when we do, it is a, it is a one-time initial experience, but it's also a continual way that we walk in, that we grow in, and that we live out. We've got to individually be empowered by God to do what God calls us to do and to be what God calls us to be. And this is what we see happening in this text from the book of Acts. But something else happened at Pentecost. Something very important. Something that's in a sense the culmination of all that Jesus came to do and accomplish. And that is the church. The gathered community of believers <coughs> was created. And in fact, <coughs> excuse me, the, the word translated church doesn't mean a building. Like we tend to say, I'm going to the church. That's not what church means Church means a, the called out ones. It used to mean a gathering of people to assemble together. And so uh, much more than before the Holy Spirit descended on them with power, they were committed to one another and gathered together for worship and study and growth in the knowledge of God's Word and fellowship. And you know, that seems a little odd, doesn't it? It seems that it was when they were individually empowered spiritually to live out their Christian life that they became more committed to one another as a group, as a community, as a body. And of course, we call Pentecost the birthday of the church. We say the church was born when, on the day of Pentecost. You know, you might have thought that they would have needed each other more before the Holy Spirit came into each of their lives. It doesn't seem unreasonable to think that now that the Spirit indwelt each one of them, empowering them to do what God wanted them to do, that they each would have just gone on their separate ways to live out the Christian faith. But that's not what happened. Because that's contrary to everything the Scripture teaches us about Christianity and church. You'll notice that they experienced an individual empowerment of the Holy Spirit when they were together. In Ezekiel, we read that when the wind blew and breathed life into dry bones, a great army was raised, not a bunch of just individual soldiers. When, the Spirit, when God's Spirit calls people, we're still ahead back there, guys. When God's Spirit calls people, 
He calls them into Christian community. But the Holy Spirit doesn't call us into Christian community to turn inward on ourselves, to focus on each other. The Holy Spirit binds us together as a body so that we might be empowered to accomplish the mission of Jesus, who came not to be served or to serve each other, but to, be, to serve others, who came not for the healthy, but the sick, who came to seek and to save not those who are already found, but the lost. Jesus, who talked about himself as a shepherd, who leaves the 99 sheep from the fold and to search high and lost, low for that one sheep that's lost, that sheep who doesn't even know he's a sheep, who doesn't know the shepherd, who doesn't know that there is a sheepfold. The slogan that Grace has embraced for several years, the branding that's on our logo, a place to connect. And we believe that, that it is God's vision for grace to be a place to connect with God, to experience this indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, empowering us to live as disciples of Jesus Christ. But we also believe it's God's vision for grace to be a place to connect with each other. That God has called us to be in community with each other. That God's Spirit can best enliven us when we are in relationship with each other, encouraging each other, praying for each other, challenging each other, holding each other accountable. But if we stopped with connecting with God and connecting with each other, we've missed a crucial aspect of God's vision for us, and that is to also connect with those in the world that God has called us to serve. Those out there who aren't part of grace or any congregation, who don't know Jesus or what it is to be in a relationship with Jesus or to be a part of a congregation like ours. God's vision is for us to connect with them, to witness to God's grace that we have experienced in Jesus Christ, and to serve them in acts of loving service in Jesus' name. This is where the Holy Spirit points us, you see, to God, to each other, and to the world that God has called us to serve. And like those disciples gathered together in that room on that Pentecost day, we can't do this by ourselves. We can't make ourselves into the body of Christ. This vision can't become a reality by our own efforts on our own. It, it can become a reality among us only as we're receptive to the Holy Spirit invading our lives, igniting us with the passion to love each other and serve the world, empowering us to become what we cannot become on our own, in empowering us to act in ways we don't have it within us to do without the power of the Holy Spirit. Are we willing for God to move us toward that vision of connecting with God and connecting with each other and connecting with the people in the world that God loves. And so the question is, are you willing to surrender to the Holy Spirit in your life? Let us pray. Lord, we, we come before you today on this Pentecost Sunday. And Lord, it is our desire to open our lives to the invasion of the Holy Spirit. Not only in each of us individually, but in us as a, as a gathered community of faith. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Amen.